Okay. So I was a little excited about seeing the Glass Star and visiting Stoddard Hamilton's Arlington headquarters. I'd always heard good things about Stoddard Hamilton's airplanes from their customers and the aviation press, but this time I wanted to check them both out for myself. See, I do a lot of flying. One day I'm off on a long cross-country trip, and a few days later I might be up in the backcountry fishing. So far, I hadn't found any one airplane that was a good solution for both my kinds of flying without sacrificing affordability and operating economy. From what I'd read in the magazines and heard around my home airport, I already knew that the Glass Star was a completely different kind of airplane. A radical departure from Stoddard Hamilton's traditional all-composite glass airs, the Glass Star design sounded almost too good to be true. I'd considered building one of the other folding wing designs, but upon close inspection, they just didn't satisfy all of my flying needs that well. So with high hopes and just a little skepticism, I got my first introduction to the Glass Star. Even from my very first glance, I could see that the Glass Star is different indeed. The sleek appearance of the fuselage promises a high level of aerodynamic efficiency, and I was surprised to find that the smooth finish of the fuselage was simply the factory-applied outer gel coat. Only the vinyl tape stripes had been applied to accent the factory prototype. Since the metal wings, horizontal stabilizer, and other control surfaces were also left in their natural finish, it was very easy to see which parts of the Glass Star are made from what types of materials. And on closer inspection, the stout chrome molly steel fuselage cage gave me a real feeling of confidence in the airframe structure. Overall, I was a bit surprised to see the aluminum flying surfaces and the composite fuselage components all integrated into such a visually pleasing package. And the more I looked at the Glass Star, the more I got the urge to actually fly it. I remember thinking that if it flew half as good as it looked, the search for my perfect airplane might finally be over. The wide cabin doors were my first clue to the versatile nature of the Glass Star design. Even us uh, larger pilots would have no problem getting in or out. The Glass Star also has adjustable seats designed to accommodate today's pilots of varied sizes and dimensions. I was really surprised when Stoddard's demo pilot told me to jump into the left seat. He said that he wanted me to get the full experience of flying the Glass Star. And speaking of flying, the urge to crank up and go was almost overwhelming at this point. The cabin feels downright spacious with great visibility outside. The headroom in the Glass Star is exceptional, 41 inches from the seats to the overhead. And the Glass Star's cabin is wide, a full 46 inches at the shoulders. It's wider than many of the four-seat Cessnas, Pipers, and even Bonanzas that I've flown. I knew that the original factory prototype had turned in very impressive performance figures on only 125 horsepower, so I could only imagine what the 160-horse Lycoming O320 would do in the same airframe. But uh, all of our uh, all of our glass airs for 16 years have had free swiveling nose wheels, both the retractable and and the fixed tricycle versions, and they just work great. Takes a little bit of getting used to, a little bit like the Grumman American. Right now I can just hold it, I don't have to hold brakes with a fair amount of crosswind and I can just hold it, in fact I'll show you here, just pushing rudder starts to bring it around, just pushing rudder the other way and I got a wind there so I'm going to use just a touch of brake to bring it back. Very controllable. Arlington traffic, last star, E24 Golf taking off runway 16 will be departing the pattern to the south. And we just bring it out. Line it up on the dotted line, and here's where that big rudder really is nice. As you bring power up, it just tracks right down the line, just as easy as pie. And we'll just lift the nose here just a touch. We're off in less than 400 feet in a normal takeoff, and uh, just climbs rapidly away from the ground. At 70 miles per hour, the VSI showed us climbing at close to 1,600 feet per minute, so I lowered the nose to where I thought the increased airspeed would have us holding a near-level attitude. A glance at the VSI showed that we were still climbing at close to a thousand feet per minute. By the time I got acquainted with the proper level trim attitude for the Glass Star, 
we were level at 5,000 feet. While I was still marveling over the Glass Star's climb performance, the airspeed indicator caught my attention once again. Even though we were cruising along well under 75% power, it had settled at a bit over 140 knots. A quick glance at the GPS not only confirmed the high ground speed, but that the Glass Star is indeed a serious cross-country performer. In fact, the Glass Star shares the same airfoil with its all-composite, high-performance Glass Air brothers. So, okay, the Glass Star is quick, but low-speed performance is important too, especially when considering some of my favorite backcountry strips. That's when my demo pilot got into the act and showed me some things that I didn't think possible with any airplane. It's flying level now at 60 knots indicated. Same thing as far as stability goes. As I move the stick, the airplane will just stay wherever I put it. At this point, if we want to do a stall, what I'll do is uh, pull the power back to idle and pull the stick all the way back. Then I hold it back, and here's your stall. We're fully stalled. It's not an issue. If I bring the nose up a little bit higher, I can get the stall to do more of a conventional break. Here's your real tough stall. As soon as I bring up power, you'll notice the stall stops. I'll start bringing up power and fly us around 39 knots or so. But I still have aileron control. I'm rolling the airplane purposely here, just with ailerons. It's not an issue. For the guy who wants a little more slow flight performance, this airplane is just phenomenal. You don't have to fly it down at this speed for your normal flying at all. But if you like to go look at something, you like to fly slow, if you'd like to learn how, take it right down to a very minimal, minimal speeds. My surprise at the Glass Star's pussycat stall characteristics must have shown, because that's when my demo pilot let me know that a pair of small vortex generators above the leading edge and a pair of stabilizer strakes were designed to further enhance the already docile stall, even at full power and aft CG. Something that I will do sometimes on demonstrations is I'll fully slip the airplane right next to the stall speed. We're literally doing a flat turn to the left. It re this, this has no aerodynamic uh, reason for flying an airplane like this. I'll slide it the other way. Here's a right turn. I'm going to hold the wings level. Full right rudder, and I'm holding it. And uh, right on the edge, you can feel the stall wishing it could sort of develop. We're just flying it along. Just up to the pilot to develop those kinds of skills that they'd like to to fly it down this low. Heading back to the field for some landings, I was struck by the amazing visibility from the Glass Star. Even the wings seem perfectly placed to block out as little sky as possible. And the skylights are well thought out too, providing a good over-wing view when in a steep turn. Back in the pattern and slowing to approach speed, the Glass Star still felt as solid and predictable as it did at cruise air speeds. And a couple of things became real apparent the Glass Star doesn't give up airspeed very quickly until flaps are added, testimony to its aerodynamically efficient airframe. And the control feel is just plain excellent, well harmonized and precise with a very solid feel. I thought I might have a little trouble with the stick after flying with yokes all those years, but the stick felt entirely natural to me. My demo pilot suggested that I fly the pattern at 70 miles per hour and without any more coaching, he sat back to see how I'd do. He must have known something that I didn't. I flew my first pattern in an entirely normal fashion, and by the time I had full flaps in on short final, I, too, felt totally comfortable. The Glass Star's great over-the-nose visibility and solid handling made the approach very simple to manage. With a little practice, I found that approaches can be comfortably flown in the 50 to 60 mile per hour range. Slips are an added bonus for pilots like me who are interested in steep approaches into short fields. Even with full flaps and steep approach angles, the Glass Star behaves beautifully without any surprises. I could have kept shooting landings all day in this remarkable airplane, but it was time to head back in and find out more about the Glass Star specifically and Stoddard Hamilton in general. 
being in the business of, of supplying uh, airplanes for people and meeting their needs, we identified a niche, uh, a, a, what we felt was a much wider niche than the, the high performance niche that was being unfilled at the time. And uh, spent a lot of time and effort uh, researching that niche before we actually uh, began developing the airplane. We, we really tried to hammer on the low end first and the safety more from a uh, beginner uh, type of pilot. Like Ted said, uh, the niche, niche is broader, more people involved, but we wanted the safety and the slow speed to be handled and then whatever we got on the high speed was just uh, frosting on the cake. I've got kids that I want to teach to fly in the airplane and there's a, there's a level of intimidation uh, with a tail dragger where the tendency isn't to stay straight, it's to skew off the field. Whereas with the tricycle, uh, gear behind the CG, the tendency is to straighten out the airplane if you're, uh, as you land. And so, but then again, um, I'm putting in a little airfield at my place. It's a rough field. I wanted to have the prop clearance. I wanted to put on the big gear. Um, I, I've been to those back strips. I've got a whole bunch of other air strips that I really want to go to uh, uh, that I haven't been into and haven't had the ability to go into. And so I want it as a tail dragger, personally, for, uh, as my plane uh, when I'm using it. So these, these philosophies went into the, the airplane, and so we ended up with a convertible gear. And the goal was to keep the same gear that goes in as a tail dragger can be the tricycle main gear as well and, and, and utilizing a socket uh, system and one bolt to pull them out. We went out and sat in a 152 for several hours. We measured a 152. We got very uncomfortable and assessed the 152. That pretty much dictated what we went out to do to set out as a goal to make a very comfortable cabin, a big cabin. Our, the, the glass star cabin will currently fit people up to about seven feet in height. Uh, the seats actually move uphill as you scoot them forward or move them forward so that smaller people, shorter people uh, actually move uphill. Uh, the utility in terms of what this airplane would carry was, was high on our list and uh, we built a uh, tremendous baggage area in the airplane that would carry uh, uh, over 200 pounds of, of baggage and that's quite a bit for a, a two-place airplane. In fact, one of the common questions people ask us is, can I throw two seats back there? And in, in general size, this thing's about the size of a Piper Clipper, and you could put a small bench seat back there and call it a four-place airplane, but we wanted, we wanted the airplane to be known as the best two-place airplane on the market, the highest utility two-place instead of a small four. In the assembly process of the airplane, we looked very long and hard at all the tasks required of a kit plane builder. And the things that we found were very, very time consuming, where all the fabrication type structural things that go into the, uh, uh, the fuselage, the wings, uh, areas like that. And that led to the design of an internal skeleton, which is nothing new in the field of aviation, but marrying that to a fiberglass composite shell with aluminum wings was unique. And it gave us the opportunity to give to the customer every hard point and every attach point that they would need for the gear attachment, the wings, seats, instrument panel, controls, uh, anything you can think of that gets bolted into that airframe is there with a welded boss or a flange or something on that cage and it'd be, it takes much of the fabrication out of the assembly of the airplane and turns it into pure assembly. Very easy to do. The materials that we chose for the airplane are all weather materials. The airplane, if a person chooses to leave it out for, for years at a time, he can do so. Um, but the airplane is not vulnerable to the environment as, as, as a tube and fabric airplane would be. The cost of ownership was high on our list of items that we wanted to uh, address. And that means not what it costs you to purchase the airplane or to build the plane, but once you have the airplane flying, it's what does it cost you to own this airplane? And hangar rent came up. The airplane takes up so little space when you fold the wings, you can actually tuck it into the corner of a hangar with other airplanes. Uh, and I, I imagine that several people on the same airport that are owners of Glass Stars will get the idea that, hey, let's, let's share a hangar, and they'll reduce their hangar rent by a half or a third or two thirds. I think another uh, exciting thing about the folding wings is that uh, typically what we'd seen in the past is where people had ended up disconnecting controls. And uh, one of our design parameters were, was that the controls would uh, remain intact, 
they would not get disconnected so that that, that was one less thing for the person to worry about uh, as far as getting it all back together when they when they uh, took off to go flying the market acceptance of the airplane um, uh, has been more it's more of a confirmation uh, of the fact that we know that people like the same things that we we do in an airplane the, the personal gratification came to me uh, at Oshkosh uh, shortly after we began shipping the kits I had two gentlemen come up to me and ask me the question of when they were going to receive their wing kit and uh, I asked them the question back well you get your tail kit first did you get your tail kit yet knowing that we'd only been shipping these things for several months and they said, matter-of-factly, yes, we got it uh, just last week. And I said, well, aren't you working on your tail kit? And they said, it's done. For me personally, uh, taking a trip up to British Columbia in a float plane about eight years ago uh, gave me the desire, strong desire, to go back and catch some bigger fish. And this, this niche that we're talking about here, a high-wing strut-braced airplane, uh, is ideal for the addition of floats, and so it was it was something that was set out as a goal from the beginning and the development of this airplane uh, will continue until that goal is achieved until we're actually together on a lake in British Columbia with some trout in a frying pan right and then the mosquitoes as well <laughs> <laughs> of course most aircraft designers are expected to be a bit fond of their airplanes but after talking to a few kit plane builders I understood that the ease of construction is often oversold by kit manufacturers. So I considered myself fortunate to intercept Jim and Julie Londo as they left on their way to California with their freshly assembled Glass Star in tow. I built a Glass Star because I thought it was a real good airplane. I needed an airplane that I could put on my trailer and take with me wherever I go. So here it is. I've actually built this in six months. I've been on it nine months, but some of that time I wasn't working on it. It's a good, safe airplane. Uh, I've been looking for the last, about the last five years for a good kit airplane that I could fold the wings, and I wasn't really happy with uh, what was out there, and then the glass tar came along. And because uh, Stoddard Hamilton uh, designed it and uh, built it, I knew it was gonna be good, and the quality of the parts that I got, I really couldn't believe it that a home-built airplane would have such quality stuff. Uh, all the skins are all pre-punched. All the critical locations in the airplane are already done for you. You have to, you don't have to do a lot of measuring because it's all measured out for you. When I first started, I was really scared, thinking, "Do I have enough talents and abilities to do that?" I'd never riveted before, but I did it, and it turned out really good. Building an airplane isn't like having to clean up a basement or sweep out a garage, it's fun. And you go through this whole process and you think, this is just great. But that's not where it ends, it just, that's, it just starts. You get to get into this airplane and you get to fly it all over. I can fly 165 miles an hour at 20 miles to the gallon. And I can go into tiny little unimproved strips like my backyard, just landing in the grass. I can go all over. I can fly it across the country. I can go to Oshkosh. I'm sure that somebody will probably fly one across the ocean uh, because it would be real easy because of the speed and because of the terrific load that it'll carry. My husband built this airplane and it gave him an awful lot of pleasure and soon to give me a lot of pleasure because I'm gonna learn to fly it. Um, I'm a helicopter pilot. I have approximately 500 hours in a helicopter. No experience in an airplane. And my husband took me up in the Glass Star and asked me if I wanted to try to fly it, which I did, and I was amazed at how simple it was. I, I was afraid that I'd flip it upside down, put it into a spin or a stall, and nothing like that. It was 165 miles an hour, and it just, it was smooth, it was easy. I thoroughly enjoyed it. After getting the builder's perspective on the Glass Star, I came to a few key realizations. The first is that the fuselage cage is the most innovative thing about this design. Not only does the cage serve as the primary load path for the airframe, but it allows the glass star to be assembled quickly and with precise alignment. The fiberglass fuselage halves simply bolt to the cage, requiring about 50 hours to finish the glass work. And since the cage arrives fully factory welded, it turns the typical labor-intensive kit building routine into more of a simple assembly process. 
Another important thing is how easy the wings and tail group are to build. All the wing components are already preformed or pre-punched and are even pre-drilled for easy alignment and final assembly. Both the front and rear extruded aluminum spars are pre-drilled at all rib and bracket locations and even the wing fuel tanks are pre-made and totally eliminate the problems associated with building a wet wing. Another thing that really struck me was the absolutely beautifully finished parts that come with the Glass Star kit. They're even logically organized and packed on see-through blister pack cards for easy inventory and storage. Some kit manufacturers think providing a part means shipping a blueprint with a chunk of aluminum. But Stoddard Hamilton is more interested in providing a part that's ready for assembly, allowing the builder to get his or her glass star to the flight line in the shortest amount of time. And that's when the adventure really begins. The incredibly wide glass star performance envelope, coupled with changeable gear configurations and easy adaptability to floats and skis, fits perfectly with what I think the ideal airplane should be able to do. Throw in the folding wings and the quickly removable tail feathers, and suddenly storage options become almost endless. A single hangar can house several glass stars, so can a garage for that matter. Which brings up affordability. Anything that can be designed into an airplane to lower the cost of flying becomes very important to any aircraft owner. Here is yet another area where Stoddard Hamilton has excelled with the Glass Star design. At this point, I must admit to running out of reasons not to build and fly a Glass Star. Everything I'd seen and heard during my visit indicates that the Glass Star is a class act, just what you'd expect from an experienced company that has such an exemplary history of solid designs and customer satisfaction. In my tour of the factory, Stoddard Hamilton's experience of over a decade and a half in the kit plane business showed in every facet of the Glass Star production. It was now pretty obvious to me that the Glass Star isn't one of those difficult airplane projects that will sit gathering dust. And I was also beginning to fully realize that Stoddard Hamilton had really outdone themselves in creating an incredibly useful airplane that also sets new standards in ease of assembly. I couldn't help but go back to the ramp for one last look at the Glass Star, and then I couldn't come up with a single reason not to get one for myself. Out of all the kits that I'd looked at and flown, the Glass Star was the only one that completely satisfied each and every one of my personal requirements. I was just about to order the tail group kit before I came to my senses and changed my mind. Yeah, I just went ahead and ordered the whole enchilada. And having made that decision to assemble and fly a Glass Star, I suddenly couldn't wait to get started. And now I can't stop thinking about all the things I'll be able to do with my very own Glass Star. But first, there's this little matter of cleaning up my garage.